Welcome to this edition of Author Author, I'm Joe Skelly. According to today's guest, everyone has a philosophy of life, but few of us have the privilege or leisure to sit around and puzzle out the fine points. And it's time we did. Dr. Lou Marinoff is here with his new book to show us how. It's called Plato, Not Prozac, Applying Philosophy to Everyday Problems. Marinoff is a philosophy professor at the City College of New York and a pioneer of the philosophical practice movement in North America. He is also the founding president of the American Philosophical Practitioners Association. In his book and work, he counsels others to use philosophy to handle such everyday problems in relationships, family, work, and midlife crisis. Lou Marinoff, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you very much, Joe. Pleasure. Now, we've heard of philosophers being involved in business ethics, bioethics, and, you know, these great uh, problems of our day, but everyday problems? Is philosophy making a comeback? Yes, of course it is. It's a very old set of ideas whose time has come around anew. Philosophy in antiquity used to be about the art of living. It's only in the last hundred years or so that it's become so institutionalized as to virtually remove itself completely from everyday life, and that surely can't be allowed to go on indefinitely. So how did we get off track? Well, I don't think we got off track. We just evolved this way. Basically, it, it was developments, I think, primarily in science and especially in medical science uh, that went so far that they tended to outstrip everything else, and eventually I think they're uh, reach has exceeded their grasp. So people who are in some way or another disenchanted with what they've received in terms of talk therapy are now turning toward philosophers. Who they find can actually do things for them with ethics and values and the meaning of life and so forth. Well, do you think it happened not only in philosophy but a lot of fields, you know, particularly because of the scientific method where we got off deeper and deeper into, you know, smaller and more, you know, specialized areas? Does that happen? Sure. I mean, there are so mm -hmm. many threads here in this tapestry, but you've identified at least two very important ones. Sure. Overspecialization has, in fact, been inimical to any kind of communication across areas, but the spin-off for, for public life is that people feel very fragmented, and really philosophy is a way of integrating the pieces of one's life together again in some comprehensible whole. And there's also the idea that the technological spin-offs of science provide us with quick fixes. People tend to think now probably because they're trained to do so, that there's a quick fix for everything. But that's simply not the case, unfortunately. So there's not quick fl fixes with philosophy? I mean, can we talk about a pop philosophy now? What, what is happening with this movement? Let's talk, about the, the, let's talk about Descartes for a second, okay? okay? If we were Cartesians, we'd believe in the body and we believe in the mind. So since America lately, I think, has become a culture that has really expressed a tremendous interest in physicality, at some times, uh, in a way that's inimical to mentality. If you want to be a great athlete, if you have the capacity to do so, you have to train. You don't open up a pill bottle and become uh, a, a decathlete. You have to go out there and put in the time. You have to train your body. Well, why should it be any different for the mind? If you want to practice virtues, if you want to develop excellence of character, if you want to be ethical, if you want to understand things, well, why should that be any quicker than doing things with the body? So philosophy, of course, is a way to understand and develop the mind. Maybe you should be talking to politicians, because it seems like this is going to be a big issue for the 2000 election. It, could, w it could well be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in fact, this has come up a lot, uh, especially in light of Hillary Clinton's latest disclosures about Bill. Uh, and I, I do believe that Bill is not suffering from anything called Clintonitis. <laughs> <laughs> what about our therape therapeutic culture? Because you. You're pretty critical of it in this book. And in the title, Plato, not Prozac, you're saying philosophy can maybe go in place of Prozac or psychology or psychiatry? Well, there's a lot there to touch on, but uh, at times, yes. I mean, for, for one thing, I am not in any way an enemy of psychiatry or psychology in the sense that I think there are some people who uh, are definitely potentially harmful to themselves or others. and these people perhaps need some kind of restraint, whether it's pharmacological or some other kind of physical restraint. This should not be the norm, however. You know, at the other end of the spectrum, most of us, and it's nothing like one in 10 or one in five or you know, one in two people who are mentally ill in America. That's simply a myth. Most of us have problems. It's the norm to have problems. The point about philosophy is that we can apply the insights of a 2,500-year-old wisdom tradition, East, West, and every other place, to help manage or resolve problems of everyday life. And that's what we do. Again, psychology is sort of in the middle. It's harnessed itself a little bit to the medical model. So if you have some kind of emotional problem or you're upset or you feel traumatized, psychologists will often tend to root around in your past 
you know, for the cause or the putative cause of these events. That might sometimes be the case. Uh, and in, in fact, the emotional life is very important. But philosophers will not necessarily regard the past as the key to the future. It's what's happening now that is important. There may be something imposed on you externally. You need to respond to that with a set of beliefs, a set of understandings and interpretations which are conducive to the moment. This is what philosophy can help with. Now, of course, you're a professor. You teach philosophy. But you're also a philosophical counselor or yes. practitioner. Yes. Tell us what that means and uh, about this movement that's happening in the country. Uh, I'd be pleased to. Uh, this is a movement which originated in its most recent incarnation in Germany in, in 1981. Gerd Achenbach hung out a shingle and uh, billed himself as a philosophical counselor. It very quickly spread to other European countries. And now, of course, it's going worldwide. Uh, I've been doing philosophical counseling for about nine years. I started off inadvertently, actually. I was an applied ethicist, among other things. You mentioned applied ethics. We could talk more about that later and how it sort of led to philosophical practice. Philosophical practice is, is generally more proactive. Applied ethicists tend to wait for something to go wrong uh -huh, and then uh -huh. develop case studies and have conferences about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we need disasters and scandals as applied ethicists to have something to do. Uh, but philosophical counseling doesn't necessarily wait for some incredible apocalyptic thing to happen. It can help people handle every day conflicts and so forth. Yes, in America, there's tremendous potential owing partly to the resources here and also the resourcefulness of Americans. Everything that's been done in Europe with philosophical practice is working even better in America. And I think this culture is in, in some ways more ready for it and more amenable to it than perhaps the old school types of philosophies. So you, you have an office? Oh, Someone uh, calls you? Nuts and bolts. Sure. Mm. I, I, philosophical practice really entails about three different kinds of activities. Uh, there's counseling, one-on-one, -on -one, and I see clients, yes, uh, in my office. Uh, I see them either privately or indeed on a pro bono research protocol at City College. So people who, who need counseling, who are good candidates for this kind of counseling, can see me for free on the research protocol. Uh, we also work with groups. And uh, this is done informally in philosophers' cafes. I moderate a monthly one uh, at a Barnes & Noble in Chelsea. It's usually very well attended. You see, there's an intelligentsia out there that's been marginalized by tabloid culture. And people really need to sit around and challenge each other's beliefs and defend what they believe in. We talk about questions like, what is justice? And what is education? And what should we be doing? And so forth. We ask all the normative stuff. This is not necessarily happening on television a lot, <laughs> notwithstanding this program. And it's also not something you get in the classroom a lot. If you take graduate courses in philosophy, of course, you're going to get a lot of esoteric, interesting, abstract ideas, but nothing that's necessarily applicable to daily life. So the forums serve a tremendous purpose there. We work with groups in many other ways, too, some of them more formal. And we also work with corporations. Philosophers are more and more being engaged as consultants in the corporate world. So one-on-one -on -one individually, um, a person comes to you, maybe they've already had some psych psychological counseling? Some have. Uh, maybe they found results, maybe they haven't? Yes, some, some people, in fact, I think psychology is a very good preparation. It's a way of, of understanding oneself, and it's very important. Uh, if you want to know thyself, uh, uh, according to the Socratic dictum, know thyself psychologically by all means, but this is not the end. Uh, psychology is a relatively new discipline. It emerged from philosophy about 100 years ago, not that much more. And of course, there are certain views and certain limitations to it. It's very important to know yourself psychologically, but many of my clients find this is not sufficient. So they go on and they understand themselves philosophically as well. Now, of course, they can get uh, health care coverage going to a psychologist, maybe, but for a philosopher like you, th they're going to pay for it, right? Unless they're on the research protocol, they're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're happy to pay for it. But then again, it's not that accessible to those who can't afford to pay for it. So we have some initiative in New York State now. Assemblyman Ruben Diaz, Jr. is sponsoring a bill that would license us in New York State. This would basically put us on a level playing field with other talk therapists. And, and th his reasoning is quite, quite lucid. If your primary care physician, who is a doctor, obviously can refer you to a psychologist who is not a doctor, uh, and yet your health insurance will pay for the talk, you should be able to get referred to a philosopher, too, if your problem is appropriate for philosophical counseling. So run us through. You've got many examples in the book you know, of people struggling in their marriage, their work, relationships, whatever. What happens when someone comes to you and says, you know, hey, my marriage isn't going real well. We've been married a few years. And we just don't communicate well. What are you gonna? What, what are you gonna do? Well, the first thing I need to do is, uh, in an initial consultation, assess whether this person is a good candidate for philosophical counseling. I'm not making a diagnosis. I'm not a doctor. I'm not trained to diagnose. Uh, on the other hand, 
philosophical counseling proceeds by dialogue, not by diagnosis. So the person should be reflective, inquisitive, curious, seeking some kind of a solution. That's a sign of health, by the way. If you have a problem and you want to confront it, you want to work on it, this does not make you mentally ill. This makes you, in a sense, mentally well. The problem is if you're diagnosed with something and you believe the diagnosis uh, in terms of uh, you know, a syndrome or a disorder or something that someone might make up uh, for the sake of labeling you, uh, this might not be too conducive to your progress. I would ask the person, what do you want from this marriage? What are your goals in this marriage? What are your needs? Are they being met? What are your wants? Are they being met? What kind of expectations do you have? Are they realistic? Are they not? What are you contributing to this marriage? What are you, in fact, seeking to take from it? And there are a whole host of questions that one can ask without mentioning Plato or Nietzsche or any other philosopher, just to get a sense of this person's position. The idea here is that everyone has a philosophy of life, in my view, whether it's articulated or not. Most people don't have the leisure, as you quoted earlier, to sit around and really make what is implicit explicit. So our job as philosophical counselors is a little bit like the midwife in Plato's Thetidus. What we want to do is illuminate your philosophy for you, to help you to do this. So we know how to conduct an inquiry to help you to actually elucidate your beliefs. And then we can look at your implications. We can look w at, the, at the reasons you have for holding the beliefs you do, see whether they're well-founded, what are the implications of these beliefs in your conduct, what principles do you adhere to, what would you like to change? Sounds so rational. Well, it is. I mean, what's wrong with that? You, you say rational as though it were pejorative. <laughs> well, it sounds like, I mean, I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to a counselor. This should be delving into the emotions. I mean, we're, we're so trained in that trained. therapeutic culture think that it's emotions and going back to the past. And You're conditioned to accept that in counseling you need to work only on your emotions. And this, in fact, is a grave fallacy to which many people have fallen prey. You're not allowed to think, oh, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? You go on feeling forever. You can wallow in your emotions until eternity. You never resolve anything. I'm not denying them. But I I if you appreciate that really human beings are at least dual faceted. We have very strong emotional forces that work in our psyches. We also have very strong forces of reason. Basically, we've marginalized the forces for reason. The emotions in the short term are very powerful, and they need to be addressed, and also they need to be expressed constructively. But in the long run, reason does govern us. The principles we choose to live by are principles chosen by reason, not by emotion. And these can be examined and should be. How long would a session take, or how many sessions? You know, Give some examples of results. We work typically the 50-minute hour. Mm -hmm. uh, sessions can be conducted by telephone. I have a case in the book that deals with a high school principal who had something go wrong with a charitable lottery. And uh, students you know, were raising money for pledges. Uh, and uh, they were th therefore entitled to um, tickets to a raffle according to the amount of pledge money they raised. It, the grand prize, it turned out, was won by a student who hadn't participated in the fundraising because it had been given. Uh, the ticket had been given as a gift. This caused all kinds of problems. There was a question of moral entitlement, not merely legal entitlement. And the principal was actually losing sleep over this. I mean, he was in a position where he needed to resolve the conflict. He had uh, now a problem that was taking on epic proportions in this school. The students were unhappy, the parents, the, you know, the committee. So what does he do? Well, Prozac is not going to help him in this case. It may, in fact, help him to feel happier, but the situation isn't going to resolve itself. So we had a discussion about the ethical consequences of various options, and we finally resolved the issue by telephone in one consultation. About 30 minutes sufficed. Other people I would see for up to a year, perhaps, but typically only once a week, once every two weeks, sometimes once a month. You see, in philosophical counseling, we want people to become self-sufficient, not codependent. So I'm trying to get rid of my clients. I'm not trying to keep them on a string. Mm -hmm. Ethics seem to be a big part of this. You say proper scientific method, notwithstanding behavior psychology, will never yield a system of ethics, one of the key components of human life and a subject an entire vein of philosophy is devoted to. Surely. Well, never is a bit of a strong claim. We don't know. If the uh, geneticists are correct and we map out the whole human genome and one day uh, begin to identify exactly how our genes translate into behaviors, it may become possible, as the sociobiologists would have it, to tell, let's say, a Quaker from a Nazi merely by looking at their DNA. I don't see this in the near future, however. I think that obviously our environment, our conditioning, 
uh, and what we're exposed to as people has as great an impact on our beliefs and our behaviors as do our genes. The issue then is how do you interpret the data that you know genetically and the data that you know about yourself behaviorally. Philosophically, you can actually synthesize this and find for yourself a position that's workable, notwithstanding what color eyes or hair nature has given you, notwithstanding what kind of family and its traumas you know nurture has given you. You can transcend this with philosophy. You're not doomed by your genes and you're not doomed by your upbringing. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the book, too, is helping. I mean, this is part of your process of helping, of counseling someone through a problem. Part of the process is helping them tap into the wisdom of the ages, whether it's a classical philosopher or a more a modern philosopher. Give us some kind of survey of how you help someone tap into that wisdom. Okay. I don't know what you mean exactly by a survey, but uh, it happens that some problems can be resolved without mentioning a philosopher's name. So I'm doing something now that's contrary to what you asked me. If you came to me with a problem and I said, uh, Plato, would that make you feel better? And <laughs> if, if I said, no, Nietzsche, would that make you feel? Not necessarily. One can trivialize this. It can become the practice of sympathetic magic if we simply allow name calling or name pronouncement to do the work. That's the quick fix well, idea. Well, Plato again. said this. Ah, Plato said what? something, yes, but then mm -hmm. it's more important what Plato said than who said it. And mm -hmm. in fact, people very often, uh, thoughtful people who are good candidates for this kind of counseling, very often reinvent bits and pieces of what other great philosophers have said or done, which is exactly what Plato's theory of education and knowledge is about anyway. Again, you have a certain wisdom inside. You need to be put in touch with it. So it's possible to conduct a philosophical counseling session without actually overtly referring to the tradition. That works for some people. Okay? For others, it's very important for them to be connected with a strain or a strand of You're philosophical You're not trying wisdom. to impress them with your knowledge or with you know, that Plato had all the answers or Buddha or whoever, because you, you quote people from all around the world and all traditions. Sure, but it's a question of old-fashioned American pragmatism. I think, okay, you have a problem. Okay, fine. Now, there are hundreds of philosophers out there who have compiled not only from their own living experience, but also from a lot of reflective, thoughtful, meditative time, ideas about how the world works. Maybe some of these ideas can benefit you. So it would be my job in that kind of a case to put you in touch with some of these systems. I would listen to you, listen to your concerns, and make some kind of internal judgment about what kind of philosophy might appeal to you. Then I would connect you with it, basically. And we could talk about the ideas of Plato or Nietzsche or Aristotle or Wittgenstein and see if they could be applicable to your problem. And sometimes it happens. For example, uh, I directed someone to a principle of Aristotle's. This was also a moral kind of situation. The person uh, was helped by the idea that many things are, in fact, permissible if they're done in moderation, whereas extremes of indulgence or extremes of denial are, for Aristotle, vices. What we need to do is find a moderate way through. Having said that, it's not the case that everything, as Aristotle was quick to append, works in moderation. We don't believe in moderate amounts of adultery or moderate amounts of violent crime or other things. But many things can be done in moderation. So this worked for the case at hand. And then the client said, you know, I want to know more about this philosophy of moderation. I want to delve more deeply into Aristotle. What should I read? OK, then I, it's easy. Bibliotherapy is, is, is clearly called for. I prescribed the Nicomachean Ethics. He read it. We discussed it further. So this can happen. Uh, we can open doors for a client into particular avenues of philosophical inquiry. We were talking a little bit earlier. I mean, you've got a nice uh, portion of the book, which was surprising to me. You said that uh, the Vatican and the Catholic Church has done more to promote philosophy in recent years than, than most religious traditions. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's extraordinary what's going on. If you read the Pope's latest encyclical, Faith and Reason, uh, or the Autumn Encyclical, it contains an appeal to uh, Roman Catholics to read philosophers that the Church had formerly banned or proscribed and so forth. So it's a complete reversal. This is a wonderful sort of phase, I think, that the Roman Church is moving into. And on a grassroots level, uh, there is a small private at Roman Catholic institutions supporting those values in, in New Jersey called Felician College. And they, in fact, uh, are sponsoring the first accredited graduate course in philosophical practice in the US, which I have the privilege of teaching. Uh, there is also a wonderful man uh, in the tri-state area, Roshi uh, Robert Kennedy, SJ, who is both a Jesuit and, and a Zen master. So I think that within the church at a grassroots level, there are all kinds of philosophical initiatives taking place, or so it seems from my perspective, mm -hmm. which I don't think is too distorted given the Pope's encyclical. 
What about that relationship between philosophy and religion and theology? Well, you know, they're really too... It's been difficult. It has been, but uh, that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. Again, not everything that's difficult should be avoided. I think that really we're looking at two sides of the self-same coin. The, the, the Chinese notion here of the complementarity of opposites as really being a unity is useful in understanding this dichotomy or apparent dichotomy. What I mean is simply this, that if you look at religion, all religions function basically on the premise of faith. I mean, if you have no faith, you've lost your religion. If you've lost your faith, you've lost your connectedness with that system of belief. So people who believe have to have faith. Philosophers tend to manifest doubt, on the other hand. So if you are capable of faith, you are also capable of doubt. It's only the people who are capable of neither that are sort of lost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where is this all going to be in the next decade or so? The future of philosophy in terms of education? Is that going to change in colleges? And oh, very definitely. Mm -hmm. Very definitely. I mean, philosophy is, is making a comeback as if almost inadvertently it's been rediscovered as a useful guide to putting all the pieces together and so forth. As we move into the next millennium, I think that there are many old ideas whose time has come again. But the new part of it uh, is that philosophical practice, I believe, is going to become a very serious profession in this country. At least myself and my colleagues in the APP are working very hard to make that tr a reality. Mm -hmm. And you have said that um, the corporate philosopher will become a fixture of the 21st century organization. Yes, it's already happened in Europe and it's happening in the United States. There are many colleagues of mine who are actively involved. Some of them come from business ethics backgrounds or biomedical ethics backgrounds, but others are more, again, proactive practitioners who actually go in, work with corporations in helping build mission statements, helping implement ethics codes. For example, it, it was learned empirically, which is a fine way to learn, by management consultants that you can't just fax or email around a code of ethics and expect people to abide by them. <laughs> you know, that's another quick fix. It doesn't work. You could labor quite lovingly and build a very good code of ethics, but then you need to implement it. And the way that it's implemented is by training through workshops, through practice. You have to devise philosophical exercises so that people can learn what it means in reality to put this precept into practice. Also, people need to be able to reconcile, for example, the uh, public uh, ethics of uh, their profession or their corporation with their own private moralities, which may differ and which constitutionally can differ. So there are all sorts of things that philosophers can do to improve the ethos and enhance the functionality of corporations. I think the biggest message that we have to send so far is that virtuous organizations function better than vicious ones and therefore can also be more profitable. Mm -hmm. Just a few minutes left, can you talk a little bit about your personal philosophy of life? In just a few minutes? Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> For a philosopher, it's always difficult to be brief. You know this. Right. <laughs> My personal philosophy of life is really to use all of the things that I recommend to other people in this book. There, there's hardly a philosopher that I use for someone else that I haven't used for myself. I think that I've been my own guinea pig in a way. Um, I, I, I guess people have always said I was a philosopher even before I studied philosophy or acquired the trade union card, you know, to profess it. I think that being philosophical is, is something that one may sort of be by nature uh, more than something that's acquired. I'm not so sure. But um, I've always been interested in ways of looking at the world and our place in it, ways of understanding it. I've had the great uh, good fortune to have wonderful teachers who've inspired me, and also, of course, to be in a situation where I was able to, or perhaps create a situation where I was able to study the thinkers of the past. So uh, essentially, there's no difference between what I think and what I say in this book. I find all these philosophers useful, and I think that at a given point in one's life, um, any one of them could be really critically useful at a particular juncture where a word of wisdom can make a problem manageable or resolvable when hitherto it was not. Well, as you say, we all have a philosophy of life. A lot of us just don't make it so conscious. How do we begin if somebody's watching? I mean, certainly we can read your book, but what what are you going to, how are you going to get somebody started? Well, you begin by realizing that you have a problem that is not necessarily being addressed in completeness or in thoroughness by received modalities. You may have tried a pill or some other kind of drug, and it may have helped you in some way, but may not have touched the root 
cause of what's bothering you. And indeed, you may have tried some other kinds of therapies, and you should. You should try what's out there within reason. But if you're still troubled by something, then perhaps you should contemplate looking at it philosophically. That's the beginning. The beginning is that you seek. Uh, the Chinese have a wonderful saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So when you're ready to find a philosophical solution to your problem, the philosopher will appear. And you don't have to read the whole book either, actually. You can find that part in it which pertains to the kind of problem you're working with. And look at case studies that are similar to your own and see if you can be helped in that way. And beyond that, you can contact a practitioner near you. There are more and more of us all the time in America. We hope to be able to provide this service. You've got a website? Yes, we do. www.appa.edu. And the APPA? That's the American Philosophical Practitioners Association. And you've got a listing in the back of practitioners around the country. I, I didn't notice any in Minnesota. Not yet. I expect there will be very soon. This listing is also a year old, and with publicity and with other things that have happened, you know, this went into print with the book some time ago. So uh, the listing is now updated and can be found again at the website. We'll have more and more, and I'm sure, given the philosophical interest here in Minnesota, there are going to be a number of practitioners in this area before long. Lou, Lou Marinoff, thanks for being here. The book is called Plato, Not Prozac, Applying Philosophy to Everyday Problems. Thanks a lot for being Thank here. Thank you very much, though. It was my pleasure. You must be having a good time going around the country. And oh, sure. Oh, it's, always, it's always fun to travel and, uh, and to meet people who are interested in this. And to what kind of reactions kind of. are you getting? So far, disgustingly positive, I must say. I haven't made too many enemies yet. People seem very receptive to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to meet with such receptivity. That's why it's working. It's not because of what we do so much. It's that the time is right for it. It may also be a dangerous thing, you know, if our civilization has come to a pass where suddenly it finds philosophy relevant. It might be <laughs> grasping at straws. You never right. know. <laughs> Thanks a lot. My pleasure.